This is another of my videos about bugs around the home, how they suffer, and how to try to reduce their populations so that fewer of them are born into bad lives. Today I found two different types of bugs on this sweatshirt. The first was what appeared to be a common clothes moth. I scooped it up gently using a Ziploc bag and put it onto my microscope stand. Unfortunately, this moth appeared to be either injured or dying of old age. Its wings didn't fold in, and it was mostly struggling on its back. Sadly, deaths like this one are probably common for these moths. A clothes moth female lays an egg cluster that contains between 30 and 200 eggs. Well, in the short run, the moth population can multiply. In the long run, no more than two eggs that a female lays can survive to reproduce, on average, in a stable population. The rest of the eggs will either not hatch or will die not long after hatching. It's actually the larvae of the clothes moth that feed on fabrics especially wool and silk, but also plant-based fibers if they have body oils and sweat on them, as my sweatshirt probably did. Adult moths don't eat, but merely reproduce and then die within about a month. Unfortunately, as shown here, the dying process is not pleasant. Here you can see up close the sweatshirt on which I found the moth. To prevent moths like these from being born involuntarily into lives filled with suffering, what I should have done was to wash the sweatshirt after using it, rather than leaving residues on it. Washing body oils and sweat off of clothes may make those substances available to be eaten by microorganisms in my septic tank, but I care less about bacteria per unit of metabolism than I care about insects so feeding a few extra bacteria or whatever will eventually eat those substances seems less bad than increasing the population of clothes moths. One potential downside to washing clothes frequently, however, is that it may provide more water to plants in your septic field if you have one. If this is the case, and if water is a growth limiting factor for those plants, then more frequent clothes washing could increase the productivity of septic field plants which could be extremely bad by providing more food for insects in the lawn. Also, it's worth considering that washing clothes uses energy, which affects climate change. After washing my clothes, I store them in a plastic tub like this one to keep moths from getting in. Part of the reason I don't wash my clothes more often is that I worry about killing any bugs that might be on them, but washing clothes early can prevent more bug suffering down the road. Clothes moths are slowed down by cold weather, but they can develop even during the winter in heated buildings. This is an argument in favor of keeping your home as cold as possible during the winter. In general, winter is my favorite season of the year because it contains the least amount of bug suffering. In the summer, reducing the humidity of your home, such as through air conditioning, may reduce moth growth. Air conditioning can also prevent dust mites and other bugs. This is an argument in favor of air conditioning, although other considerations are relevant as well, including climate change impacts. The second bug that I found on the sweatshirt was what seemed to be a carpet beetle. I couldn't tell exactly what species it was, but it looked most similar to these three species, based on Google images. This carpet beetle seemed to be dead when I found it, but I assume its death was protracted and probably not pleasant. Even though carpet beetles belong to order Coleoptera, while clothes moths belong to order Lepidoptera, the two species of bugs eat similar things. Like with clothing moths, it's the larvae of carpet beetles that eat fabrics. However, adults may eat pollen and nectar. Here you can see roughly how big the carpet beetle was. 
Here's information on number of eggs laid per female and typical lifespans for carpet beetles. Coincidentally, I found a second carpet beetle not on the sweatshirt but in a plastic cup next to a clump of dust. This carpet beetle was a bit bigger and had somewhat different colors. It was also dead when I found it. Carpet beetles tend not to feed on synthetic fabrics, which is an argument in favor of wearing synthetic fabrics, although a more thorough comparison of the wild animal impacts of synthetic versus plant-based fabrics is warranted. Carpet beetles do eat animal fibers, like silk, which is a further argument against such fibers. Pet hairs can be food sources for carpet beetle larvae, which is one argument against getting a pet, although there are other arguments both for and against pet ownership. The advice for preventing carpet beetles is generally similar as for preventing clothes moths, such as keeping clothing and floors clean, putting cleaned clothes in sealed containers, and so on. Unfortunately, some methods of preventing fabric-eating pests, such as vacuuming, may accidentally kill some bugs. There is a balance to strike between not harming insects in the short run versus preventing more future suffering by controlling an infestation. I generally err on the side of not actively killing bugs, but rather just taking them outside if I find them. I definitely advise against using heat to kill bugs, because bugs generally respond very aversively to heat. The morning after I filmed the previous footage, I noticed a tingle on my left leg. It turned out that it was a live carpet beetle crawling up me. I put it onto my microscope stand to have a closer look. When I was done, I left the beetle outside. When I first put the beetle onto the microscope stand, it was upside down. Apparently, the beetle had a very difficult time inverting itself. Maybe this was because the microscope stand was clean and slippery without obstacles to push against. Eventually, I had to manually invert the beetle with a piece of paper. The beetle alternated between walking and staying stationary. At one point, the beetle stopped walking and began grooming itself. Grooming is a common behavior across many animal taxa. I'll read some quotes from one paper on insect grooming, although not everything said there necessarily applies to the carpet beetle in particular. The paper says, quote, Various functions have been proposed to explain insect grooming behavior. Cleaning dust particles from sensory organs. Smearing secreted or acquired cuticular lipids that constitute a familiar chemical fingerprint for insects. Parasitoid disguise, collecting pollen particles as food, and removing ectoparasites or pathogens. The importance of grooming behavior for the maintenance of sensory organ acuity has been suggested for insects as diverse as crickets, cockroaches, and flea beetles. Recent data shows that eucalyptol, the general odorant that causes excitation of a receptor housed in male pheromone-sensitive antennal scintilla, induces pronounced changes in frequency and duration of cockroach antennal grooming. According to work with cockroaches, hydrophobic odorant molecules get adsorbed and dissolved by the hydrocarbons on the epidermal surface and should be removed to maintain high temporal resolution of odor signals. There is little doubt that multiple neural feedback mechanisms tune grooming behavior according to current circumstances. In the German cockroach, for example, the marginal sensilla, located on the antennal basal segments 20 to 24, respond to the bending of flagellomeres and presumably play a role in determining the duration of flagellum grooming while well, chemoreceptors at the base of the paraglossa participate in the ingestion of debris removed from the antennae during cleaning. Grooming, therefore, is a part of the behavioral repertoire executed according to a hierarchy that produces an appropriate response to various stimuli affected by physiological conditions such as satiation, arousal, and aggression. End quote. The paper also says that Hungry insects groom less in order to save energy. 
and the authors also say that they personally had seen that when American cockroaches weren't able to clean their antennae due to damage to a body part, they used both forelegs instead of just one foreleg to successfully groom in a different way than normal. The reason I mention these details about grooming is to give more of a flavor of insect behavior and neurophysiology to help build empathy with insects like this carpet beetle.